and I think about the message that God gave me, there's a little bit of like, how did I get here? (laughs) But when we listen to the Holy Spirit, he begins to teach us out of his word, and it's so refreshing. So do you have your pens and your papers? Do you have your Bibles? Because today, I, I hope, this is what my hope is as a pastor and a minister. I don't want you to come to church and just hear something you already know. But I want you to come to church and I want you to be refreshed, number one. I want you to be cleansed. But I also want you to grow up spiritually. I want you to see the word and I want to produce for you how important the word is. Because it's your life, it's your source, it's your breath, it's your strength. I'm telling you now, if you do not understand how powerful and mighty this weapon is, you are missing out on what it is that we are here on this earth to carry out. And that's what this word of God says. And so when we dive into this, we need to respect and we need to honor and we need to reverence it. Because it's holy. And it's the words of God to us. And so please silence your phones. I don't want to hear a phone. So check your phone now. Turn it off. I don't want you to be distracted. Don't worry about your family or your kids in this moment. The Lord's going to take care of them. Because your soul matters. And I know that that God has something for us out of 1 Corinthians. We've been in 1 Corinthians. Pastor Nicole did a phenomenal job. I listened to the message. It was so good last week. And... This has just been a season where we've had a lot of panels. Did you guys enjoy the panels? Such wisdom came out of those panels. And now we're going to dive back into the word. This is a Bible study. And, you know, normally we as pastors, we say, don't use too much scripture. I have too much scripture today. (laughs) But I figured this is a Bible study, so we can do that, right? And I'm going to use the scripture because nothing I say is as good as what the scripture says. The scripture says everything it needs to say, and I don't have anything to add to it. And so let's just pray and ask the Spirit of God to speak to us. Spirit of God, have your way today. Spirit of God, move and speak through your word today. God, we ask for a refreshing, and we ask for that heaven would come, and it would open up upon us. And Lord, we pray for a revelation of your spirit today, God, in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen and amen. Well, we have been in 1 Corinthians, and it has been wonderful so far. Wonderful. We took a side note in the very beginning of it, and you can go back and get all those messages online on our app. But we went into love, and then now we're talking to Pastor Nicole. You covered the cross so beautifully last week, and I just thought that was so good. And just the understanding of the power of the cross and why it was so important. And here's Paul. He's talking to the Corinth church. The Corinth church is a lot like us. Pretty much it is us. (laughs) <laughs> and the time and day that we're living in. And they were, the Corinthians were in a hub. They were, had ships coming in, and it was a trading. And so with trading comes a lot of different cultures, comes a lot of different um, backgrounds, comes a lot of uh, worships of different idols. There was the whole Greek culture as well. So they were smart philosophers. They thought they knew it all. So there was like this whole like, you know, level of like, Ooh, what is your your take on this? And and they would have these deep theological conversations. There were temple prostitutes. That's how twisted the te- it was. There were temple prostitutes. You can go into the temple and have sex with a prostitute. There was perversion at its highest. Homosexuality, guys, is not new. It was rampant back then. And here was the Corinth church, and here was a group of people, the Corinthian Christians. And they heard about the gospel. They heard about the cross. And they said yes to Jesus. And so now what? They're living in this world. Yes, they love God. Yes, they want all that God has for them. But they're surrounded by culture. They're surrounded by processes. They're surrounded by systems, right? Am I speaking our language or what? And so here's Paul. He gets a letter from Chloe. I love that because my daughter's name is Chloe. <laughs> and he gets a letter, and she's, like, telling him, hey, you got to come. They're, like, you know, they need, they're fighting amongst themselves. they got a lot going on. So Paul writes them a letter. Now, remember, Paul had already gone to them. He had taught them. He had, he had ministered to them. He had given the word of God to them. And so in his letter, Paul is talking to them, like, hey, what are you doing? 
<laughs> and so before Paul does this, I believe he's using the sandwich method. You know Pastor Sue's good old sandwich method. You say something good, and then you do the correction, and then you follow up with something good, right? And here's Paul. He's painting the picture before he's about to get into, hey, you got some issues. <laughs> and he's saying it's the cross, which you guys learned about with Pastor, with Dr. V and with Nicole. And talking about the cross, talking about the redemption of the cross, talking about the substitution that the cross took on for us, talking about the depth and the power of what is dead raising to life. You see, there's so much in the cross and what happened on the cross for us. And that is the anchor. That is the point where they became saved. That is the Gentile and the Jew together. If they believed upon the cross, if they know that Jesus is Lord, then they shall be saved. And so Paul is talking to them, and he knows that they need the power of the Holy Spirit operating in their lives. Paul knows. Now remember who Paul is. I'm painting a picture for you right now. Paul was a rascal. Paul was a know-it-all. Do we know any know-it-alls? I don't know any. You know, they always have an answer for everything, and they always think they know everything, right? Like, so Paul knew it, and he actually did. Paul was a wise man. He understood the scripture. But he also killed Christians. He also persecuted God's people. And so here was God. God interrupted Paul's life. And as God interrupts Paul's life, he blinds him. He gets his attention. He turns his call around. And he puts him into a place of surrender. Paul understands at that point, okay, I know who I'm working for. And I know who is the one true God. And he turns at that point and he begins to live his whole life for God. And when we look at Paul's life, we think, I don't know many people that are snake bitten, shipwrecked, beaten, beheaded. I don't know people that live in jail most of the time of their Christian walk, and yet they reach so many people. Paul did. Paul. Paul was buffeted. He was beaten. He was tormented for the sake of the cross, for the message. And I'm grateful he was because today we sit in this room because a man all those years ago said yes to God and allowed God to put him into a place of submission and understanding of who the Holy Spirit was. And Paul said, I will give my life for it. And he did. Paul gave his life for it. So here's Paul. He's writing to them. And he's, he's not trying to be like he used to, right, the know-it-all. But Paul is coming to them with love. Paul is coming to them in humility. Paul is coming to them, trying to get them to understand how important the cross is, how important they are, and how important the Holy Spirit is for them to be living their life in this nasty culture they have to live in. And to not become like the world, to be become like Christ. So Paul is not trying to look like the know-it-all. See, life without him is not a life for us believers at all. Life without the Holy Spirit operating is not a life for us as believers at all. When you say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and lives and dwells within you. Did you know that? That you are not your own. You were bought with a price. That when you say yes to Jesus, I know this is so basic 101, but we have to be reminded about this powerful deutimous moment in our lives. Because sometimes it doesn't feel like much. But something happened in the supernatural where your old man is now crucified and you now became alive in Christ. And when you became alive in Christ, the Holy Spirit filled you and he's equipping you. And that, that power that God had for the disciples back then is the same power that he wants to give us now in this day and age. Wow. How much more do we need it now? That's what I'm telling you. This young generation is like, what have we not known? Tell us. We've been too comfortable sitting in churches hearing good messages. What's the rawness of the gospel? They're asking these questions, guys. Millennial generation was all about feelings. Whatever makes me comfortable. You, you're toxic to me. Like all of the, you've probably heard it all. And we've adopted those words into our society. But the Gen Zers are very different. The Gen Zers are kind of like, I don't really care. Just tell me like it is. So they're going back to the whole, I don't care how raw you are, just say it. Because I can handle what you're about to tell me. Because I don't, I know I'm like being tickled and I don't like that feeling. Isn't that interesting? How just different generations 
flip. And so they're like, give it to me. Tell me like it is. And I was so grateful because when God called me to be a pastor, I started with the millennials and I thought, Lord, you made a mistake. <laughs> because they hate me. <laughs> and now these Gen Zers, they're like loving it. They're like, Pastor Jess, what else does he say? And what else does God want us to do? What else is he asking of me? And I'm like, everything. Sell it all. Oh, your family's drama, guess what? Leave your father, your mother, your brother, and your sister for the sake of the cross. Woo, cultures don't like to hear that, do they? See, God came on this earth and he stripped us of everything we identify with. And Paul is going into this culture. Paul is going into this generation and he's trying to get them to hear what the cross did. Okay, so if I set this up for you, I'm on the phone the other day talking to my dad. And I'm dropping off my kid in the morning. My dad calls me, and he's thanking me because I made him a German chocolate cake that he cannot find. It is not in his house anymore because my sister Kim has it. And so <laughs> we found the cake, Mom. And so, <laughs> yeah, Kim is supposed to bring it today. And so we, we, he's thanking me for the cake, and I just, oh, Dad, of course, I love you. And he's like, all right, Jess, well, have a good day, and stay in the presence of God today. And I was like, of course, I'm studying for tomorrow. And he kind of went... <laughs> And I was like, I know why he laughed. He laughed because it's not like, don't just stay because you're studying. Like, stay because you have the luxury of being his daughter. And I just, I didn't even tell my dad I knew what he meant by that, of course, yes. I just got off the phone, and, I just, and it just stuck with me. And I felt very challenged by the Holy Spirit. Like, do you, though? And I was like, I don't know, do I? <laughs> and you have to ask yourself these questions, right? Like, do I stay in your presence? Probably not. Do I remind myself of where I'm at? Probably not enough. You know, and here's God asking us. So that's the name of the pres- that's the name of the message. That's the name of it. Living and working with the Holy Spirit. I want to pose this question to you. How do you stay in the presence of God every day? How do you do that? I started asking the Holy Spirit that and he said, "Go to your scriptures that you've been studying all week and I want you to reread them." So girls, Because this is a women's Bible study, I pulled out the Amplified Version. Because I thought that the more words that we use with the scripture, it brought deeper understanding. And so we are using the women's version of 1 Corinthians. So go with me to 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. That was a joke. You can laugh. Because we do have a lot of words. And when I came to you, brothers and sisters, proclaiming to you the testimony of God concerning salvation through Christ. This is Paul talking to the church. I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, no lofty words or eloquence of philosophy as a Greek orator might do. For I made the decision to know nothing that it that is, to forgo philo- philosophical and theological discussions regarding the inco- inconsequential things and opinions while among you except Jesus Christ. That was like, what? But this is how the Greeks were talking. So remember, they were smarty pants. They knew the word. They understood big words. They were, he was talking to a church that had been educated in words in understanding of wisdom of man, okay? But he's saying, among you, except Jesus Christ. So pretty much he's like, all of that, but all I'm talking about is Jesus Christ. And in him crucified. And the meaning of his redemptive, substitutionary death and his resurrection, I came to you in a state of weakness when he came to them and he was preaching to them. And fear and great trembling. See, Paul understood the weight of the message he had to deliver to the Corinthian church. So when he was teaching them, he was under the understanding and the weight of the word in which he knew they had to understand so that they would know the name of Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And he's saying, I came to you with weakness, great fear, and trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in a per- with persuasive words of wisdom, using clever rhetoric. But they were delivered in a demonstration of the Holy Spirit operating through me. And his power stirring, I, listen to this, and his power stirring the minds of listeners and persuading them. So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom and the rhetoric of man, but on the power of God. You see, the other day I was leaving um, my daughter. I took her to college. 
And as I was driving away from college, I had a few conversations that day with people. And I was kind of in a way flipping back and forth because I had met so many different types of people. I had met so many different socio classes, so many different types of backgrounds, so many. It was crazy. What It's like our church, right? I could walk away from on a Sunday morning and hear the craziest stories from everybody's culture. And I'm just like, whoa, <laughs> like God does bring the world here. And so I was walking away and I'm in the car and I'm kind of you know, like filtering some of the conversations I had been through with some of the other moms, with some of the other people that I had encountered. And I felt like the Lord was teaching me. Do you love these Holy Spirit moments, you know, where you're going, I don't understand how to dissect these conversations. I don't know where these people's mindsets are coming from because I didn't live like them. So I don't understand where they're coming from. So Holy Spirit, teach me. And that's what I asked him. And, and God said this particular person was, was coming and they were talking and they were having a hard time with this transition for their daughter. And I felt like maybe I had come across harsh when I was talking to them. The Spirit of God told me, no, you said exactly what I needed you to say to them because there's a mindset that has to be stripped. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, they don't know anything but this way of living. They don't know anything but this, this society and the culture into which they were raised in. And yet they're about to step into kingdom and their daughter, this has been a gift from me for her. And I thought that was beautiful, right? So God is taking and growing them up in their thinking, expanding their understanding of the world and their surroundings. And I felt like God was saying, you have to understand that when you come sit under the word, Jess, that it begins to change your thinking because you're no longer under the ideas and the ways of what you know, but you're sitting under something supernatural. And when my word is being spoken, something supernatural begins to happen. Because the Holy Spirit is at work when the word is being taught. And so when people come to church, that's why we put an emphasis on you coming and getting your cute little butts into church. Right? Because when you get into the house of God and you sit under the word of God, there's something that's supernatural that begins to happen. And the word of God begins to penetrate our mind, our soul, and our spirit. It goes to the deep places in which God knows how to get to. And we have to step outside of what we thought we knew and step into what God is teaching us, and that's kingdom culture. And so here's God in this moment. Paul understands what's happening. I love how he says he's stirring the minds of the listener and persuading them so that their faith would rest not on the wisdom and the rhetoric of man. Boy, do we need that right now. But on the power of God. See, guys, we're about to go into our election year. We have some decisions to make. You may not need to vote as you voted before. I don't know, guys. I don't know who is godly. I don't trust anybody but Jesus. And the reality is, is that we need to hear from the voice of God on everything we do. There's times and seasons for you and your families and your children, and as you step in and out of seasons, you're going to need the voice of God. You're going to need the Holy Spirit to be with you in those moments of transition. You, when you are in a, just a way, have you ever just been in a way with your husband? Like you just, ugh. It's not, not that I don't love you, not that I don't like, I just don't even not like you. I just, uh. I'm not there right now, but I have been there. And I remember having to talk to the Holy Spirit like, what is this? And the Holy Spirit said, just press into me. Ask me for what you need and I'll give it to you. When you don't feel, right, like you should. When you're crabby, hmm? anybody crabby? When your hormones are raging and they're going crazy and you know you're going crazy and then afterwards you're like, that was annoying. The Holy Spirit knows you. He created you. He formed you. He knows how to talk to you. He knows how to get to you. He knows how to be with you every single day. And I think this is what Paul was trying to say to them. Was like, the cross and Jesus is everything you need because he left the Holy Spirit to begin to teach us and to live this out. See, Paul wanted this for them so bad. So what was Paul's reasoning for helping them live every day in the presence of God? How do we live every day in the presence of God when life is hard around us? Number one, you ready for it? You got to live humbly with the Holy Spirit. That means you got you to be submissive to what the Spirit of God wants. 
and not what maybe you're thinking or what you think you need or what you think you want. But you have to be big enough to say, what do you want, God? What is it you're doing right now? And Paul humbled himself in front of the people and to the Holy Spirit. And he was showing them as a living example and a demonstration of how to work with the Holy Spirit. See, pride will ruin this for us. Pride will ruin it. When you think you know it, when you think you know what God wants, right? How many times have I been there? I've been there so many times. Oh, no, I know that God wants me to do this. And then I'm like, was that me or was that God afterwards? Because it just was weird, right? And I'm like, yeah, the grace of God kept me, but it was messed up. And that was not God. What was it? It was pride. Pride working in me and through me, right? I've got to get rid of that. And the way to do that is I've got to stay in a place of submission to the, to the Holy Spirit. I've got to just constantly put myself under what the Holy Spirit wants more than what I think I want or need. And we're living in a time and a day and age, and it's been, like, ever since I was young, I remember everything started to become I everything, right? Like, have it your way at Burger King. And, and like, I this and I that, iPad, iPhone, I, I, I. They were already doing this, and it was becoming the, we are now our own gods. We are now our own gods. And with that comes pride, it comes narcissism, it comes, you know, all these things that the world is highlighting and God is saying all of those things are not something that I operate in. So if you want me in your everyday, you've got to get rid of these things. Because if you do, then I can be present and I can lead you the way you need to go. And so pride comes also in insecurity, did you know that? Especially for us women. Because we're still looking at ourselves. We're still looking at what isn't. I, I'm bad at this. I, will, I constantly, and God has been working on me with this, but I will talk bad about myself at times. Because there's always something bad to not like about yourself, right? Whether it's your character, whether it's the way your body looks, whether it's, I don't know, the way you talk or maybe the way that you think. I mean, you can beat yourself up. You are your own worst enemy and your own God. What a place we were never supposed to be. <laughs> because of the cross, you don't have to be your enemy. You can be your own cheerleader. Because of Christ in you, you are more than enough. And he's got you. And he made you. And he loves you. He loves the way you look. He loves the way that you breathe. He loves the way that you, you are. He loves your personality because he gave it to you. Now, you may have to learn how to work that personality for the Holy Spirit and with the Holy Spirit. But he gave it to you, so stop putting it down. Don't let curse words come in that people have said about you. Don't let the words of somebody else put you in a box. Because the Holy Spirit says those are all prideful positions that I was never a part of. And we are living our lives out in a spirit of pride as Christians. All week I've been saying these things about myself. And then all of a sudden I, I, I can hear the Holy Spirit, stop it. Stop it. And I'm like, oh. No, I'm not. I'm actually good. I'm good. And God has got me, and, and it's okay. And you know what? My body is changing because I'm getting older, and that's a good thing because I'm supposed to get older because one day I'll get so old I get to go be with Jesus, and that's the goal. Like, <laughs> so instead of being upset about the changes, how about we see them as a celebration of life lived with the Holy Spirit every day? And I felt like the Lord was just giving me these new perspectives of how I speak to myself. And then I got the phone call from my daughter. I bought her a pair of pants on Timu, you know, like the cheap thing. Just get one size up, all right? Because it's coming from another country where they're skinny. And so she, I gave her her pants. And she's like, Mom, they don't fit me. And I'm like, well, then you have lots of girls at college. Just see if somebody else wants them. I'm not, they, I don't think I can send them back. <laughs> and so she goes, okay, so-and-so got them, and now I'm mad at myself because I feel like I'm fat. And I'm like, okay, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And she goes, why do I have to have a butt? I'm all, because you're a Viking. <laughs> Vikings have calves and butts, baby. And that's who we are, and you better own it. And she was like, all right, Mom, I feel better about myself now. And I'm like, good, go out there, just have a good day. <laughs> but see, we got to change the way. Why don't we beat ourselves up? Because we compare, we play the comparison game. Pride brings comparison in front of you so that it tears you down and beats you up. And pride will beat you up. It will take you out, and it will keep you from the presence and the Holy Spirit of God every day. And Paul knew how important this was because he lived it. 
He lived most of his life in pride, and yet now he's living his life in humility to the cross. And it takes humility to see God move in our lives. See, James 4, 7 through 10 speaks so beautifully about this. And it says, so humble yourselves before God and resist the devil. Isn't that good? How do you resist the devil? Just say no. Do you remember that old, like, just say no? Just say no. Just say no to the devil. When he comes knocking, you say, no, you don't get to. When he comes telling you, no, you don't get to. Shut up. When he, just keep resisting. Don't allow, resist. Okay? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God. That was, hey, it didn't say God was coming close to you. He's already there. He says, you got to come close to God. And God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Oof. Let there be tears for what you have done. He says, what does that mean? What is that? This is like language we don't use. But let there be a contrite spirit. Let there be in your conscience. I love that Baron talked about that last night. That we, there, our conscience has to say no. That's not what God wants. That's not where God needs me to be. There has to be the umpire of our soul, and his name is the Holy Spirit. And he will come and he will say, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, don't do that. I remember when I was a teenager and my mom would say, are you feeling like no, no, no? And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, that's the Holy Spirit. One day you keep pushing the Holy Spirit away, one day he'll stop telling you. And I was like, no, because I'd always lived with that. I'll never forget the day that I pushed the Holy Spirit away when he told me no. And the next time something bad happened, I couldn't, he wasn't there. I just, I was like, I am alone. And I felt this deep darkness. And I just knew that what my mom had said was happening. Don't resist the Holy Spirit, resist the devil. Don't resist the Holy Spirit, resist the devil. And be torn about your sin so you can bring it before God. Let there be a sorrow and a deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. So many times I've, I've been, you know, as a pastor, I've been in rooms with people where they have to confess hard things. And it's a very different room when they're coming to you confessing than it is when they're caught. Because when they're caught, they can play the role, and you're like, okay, well, I think maybe they're getting it from God, and I hope so. But when they come broken and contrite, like, I just have to get this right. I have to get this out because I, before God, I just need to be right with God. It says confess your sins. I've had this one person came to me, and they were like, the Bible just says confess your I need to confess your sins. I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to know. <laughs> mm, don't tell me. And, and they were just going. And they just, blah. And I was like, okay. And the Lord was like, you got this. Just tell them that I love them and I forgive them. But he, he showed me in that moment, look how beautiful that is. Because I can now work with that person. Because there's a beauty there that comes. And it's, it's not a pride, but it's a submission to what God is doing. He says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. When you don't know why you're not being lifted up into a position of honor, I'll tell you right now, there's probably pride somewhere in there going on. And God will put a halt on all of that. There has to be a position that we come to in the presence of God where we are broken and contrite before him. And that's where he meets us. That's where we get to know him in his graciousness. That's where he, we get to take part in humility. And he gets to take part in grace and mercy and love poured out upon you. That's where the cross comes alive and the old man is dead and the new, li- the new man becomes alive. That's where the dunamis, dynamite power of the Holy Spirit begins to operate in the moment of submission. God hits it and there's something that happens in your life and it becomes a radical exchange for the old into the new. Paul wanted them to see this, and it all comes from living humbly with the Holy Spirit. In Luke 14, Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he says, Jesus noticed that they all had to come to the dinner, trying to sit in the seat of honor near the head of the table. And he came to them with this advice. When you are invited to a wedding feast, do not sit at the seat of honor. What if someone who is distinguished, more distinguished than you, has also been invited? And the host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you will have to go take a seat wherever that is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. And then when the host sees you, he will come and he will say, friend, we have a better place for you. And then you will be honored in front of all of the guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Woo, you do not want God to humble you. 
And those who humble themselves will be exalted. When you humble yourselves, God will be exalted. Then he turned Then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. This is now kingdom, guys. This is now, it turned into a very practical, now we're into kingdom, okay? Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteousness, God will reward you for inviting those listen to me, who could not repay you. That is humility. That is walking with the Holy Spirit every single day, seeing people in the eyes of God, doing life according to what God says and not what your flesh wants to do. Corey Timboom was asked about this. Corey Timboom was once asked if it was difficult for her to remain humble, and her reply was simply this. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the back of a donkey, And everyone was waving palm branches and throwing garments on the ground of the road and singing praises. Do you think for one moment it entered the donkey's head that any of that was for him? She continued, if I, if I could just be the donkey onto which Jesus Christ rides his glory, I will give him all the praise and all the honor. Let's be everyday living humbly with the Holy Spirit surrendered to what it is he wants to do in our lives. Number two. Paul was showing them that not just living humbly, but operating in the power of the Holy Spirit is something that he relies on every day. Not the ideas of man, but the wisdom of heaven. What does this mean and what does this even look like? I forgot my my illustration today, but you will get the point. I was studying for this message, and the hurricane a few weeks ago actually knocked down one of our, we have three massive old old trees and we didn't even know it fell until like the middle of the next day and so it knocked the tree down with that came the roots of all the other two trees and then a fence a water main and the air conditioner everything broke all at once it was horrible and so as we have been probably I think this is our third week this this week we got the last tree taken down because the roots were so up off the ground that if any rain would come that tree was going to fall again And so we had to remove all three trees. That was not fun. And so as they were doing it on Tuesday, there was shavings. It looked like it was snowing at my house. Like I was inside, and I'm like, damn, look, it looks like it's snowing outside. And he goes, that is not going to be fun to clean up. And I was like, what is that? And I didn't didn't remember that we were even doing, you know, the trees. I was busy inside. He's like, that is wood. That is wood shavings and wood chips. And I'm like, oh, man. And so I saw it going into our drains, you know, and if it gets into the drains and then the rain comes, you're going to have a backup. And I've already flooded my house so many times. I'm in a panic mode about flooding. And so (laughs) I go outside early in the morning and I see that all the drains are full of sawdust. And they have these really hard grates that you can't get off. And I'm like, oh, man, we had to call somebody out to get the grates off last time. And I don't know who to even call. And I'm like, I'm going to do it myself. And I'm panicking. And the Spirit of God just told me, no, you're doing none of that. You're studying today. And it was like, oh, yeah, okay, I can't do this. Don't think about it, Jess. Don't think about it. So I got through most of this message, and as I'm, I need a brain break. I'm hyper. I can't sit for too long and stare at a computer. It makes me crazy. And so I was like, I need to do something physical. I'm going to go clear the drains. So I start sweeping, and I had just my little, I have a little dust pan and a little broom outside, and I start sweeping this, and I'm thinking, I got a 15-minute break. This is not going to work. I'm going nowhere fast. Like, there, it is like little piles of wood, and it, it's like I have a whole backyard, I have a whole front yard, a whole side yard. What am I going to do? And we're the gardeners, okay? So I said, well, I guess I'm just going to have to, you know, tell Dan when he gets home. And I just heard the Spirit of God go, Dan, that's too much to think about. And I was like, well, what do you want me to do? And he goes, go get the blower. Now, if you guys know me, I hate the blower because the blower just moves dirt around. It doesn't pick anything up. It just moves it into a different pile somewhere else that you have to clean it up later anyways. And so I was like, I don't want to go get the blower. And I'm telling God this because it doesn't pick up the dirt. It just blows it. It just doesn't get rid of the dirt. You know, we need to get rid of the dirt. I'm all being spiritual with God. Like, we need to get rid of those things in our lives, you know. And he's like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Go get the blower. <laughs> and I was like, fine. So I go and get the blower. I don't know how it works. So I figure, okay, well, there's a battery. I'm going to put the battery in, and I'm going to push this button. And then and then it was like turbo. There's like a button that says turbo. And I was like, brr, brr. And I was like, ooh. Now listen, don't put a power tool in a woman's hand. I loved it. 
And I was like, this is awesome. No wonder Dan is like, oh, I'll just blow it. Because it's like fun. So I started blowing everything. I blew in 10 minutes. I timed it. The whole backyard is clean. The whole side yard is clean. And the whole front yard is clean. And as I'm washing out the end of the driveway, I'm like, that was pretty awesome. And then God says, oh, yeah, but you didn't want to go get the blower like I told you to. And I said, what's your lesson in this then, Holy Spirit? Because I'm like, I'm studying, so I'm like, there has to be a lesson in this. And he said, that blower represents me, the Holy Spirit, in your life. I will be there. I'm that extra power of gust, that extra wind in your sail. I'm the one that will help you get rid of the hard things that are in the wrong places. I will blow things out of your way. I will blow things out of your direction. I will move things where they need to be, and I will do it in my timing, not yours. And I was like, oh, I love the blower. It's my new tool. And I was like, okay, Holy Spirit, that's so cool. And he goes, but how many times do you not even engage me to find out what you need for that day or that circumstance? And I went, oh, forgive me, God. I mean, the whole message, I'm repenting the whole time. So I thought that was a cool story, so I wanted to share it with you. But the Holy Spirit is that power, that dudamous power, is like that blower on turbo, getting all those wood chips out of there, right? Getting all those things out of our lives or the people that don't need to be there. Let him remove them. Don't put it in your own hands. Let him do it, right? Like, what do you need done? Ask the Holy Spirit to become that due to my power on your behalf. We have to begin to do this. We have to begin to operate with him hand in hand. Jesus needed the Holy Spirit himself. Did you know that? That's why he descended upon him. And after the dove descended upon Jesus, guess what happened? Signs, miracles, and wonders. Jesus understood his role, but he also understood the role of the Spirit of God as well. And here it was that Jesus put such an emphasis on this, that there were signs, miracles, and wonders that came with it. Paul teaches Christians this. This will be your verse of the day. So if you want to write it down, this will be your verse for the week that I want you to study in. Ephesians 5, 15 through 20. So be careful how you live. Do not live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Do not be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord was telling me that the Holy Spirit can be your crutch, not alcohol, not a cigarette, not porn, not Netflix binging, but the Holy Spirit. Maybe we as people need to move those addictions of eating and binging or whatever it is that we do when we're stressed out, right? I'm dogging to me, guys. And we need to put on some worship music. And we need to just bask in good things that God has for us instead of things where you just want to turn off and you don't want to do the hard stuff. It's hard. It's hard to keep yourself in the spirit. It's hard to see the power of God moving on your behalf. But I'll tell you right now, when you're hungry enough for it, you will see it because he wants to do it for you in your life. See, God is moving And so the Holy Spirit says, instead of running to wine and getting drunk, how about you run to the Holy Spirit and be drunk in the Spirit? You say, those people act crazy. Well, I'd rather act crazy with Jesus than act crazy on wine and not remember what I was doing the day before. So the reality is, guys, have your pick. It's your choice. But this is what God is asking of us. You know, Paul is showing them, and um, He's showing them that he did this with the Holy Spirit working with him. That it was the power of the Holy Spirit persuading the listeners. Paul knew that that wasn't him. There was nothing he could say that could move the heart of man. But only the Spirit of God could be the one that moves the heart of man. Why? Because I cannot judge the heart of man. But God knows the heart of man. He knows what's in us. He knows what's formed in us. He knows where we're at. He knows where we're going. He knows the ups and the downs. He knows the ins and the outs. And the Spirit of God wants to speak to his people. 
And Paul understood that he had to press in to what the Spirit of God was speaking. You see, the Holy Spirit needs to be an expectation in our lives every day of his manifestation. Every day, you need to expect a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in your life. What has he done for you today? I bet you when you look back on past days, you go, oh, my goodness, I didn't even realize that he was operating. That was so good. And I just moved right past it, and I didn't even recognize that he was doing that for me at the store, or that he was doing that for me when I was driving home, or when he was guiding me and telling me just that nudge, like, get off the freeway right now. You don't need to be on the freeway. And, you know, you realize, okay, that was the Holy Spirit protecting my time, protecting my space. Like, he cares about every aspect of your life. Every aspect of your life. Let's invite him in. You know, Paul is talking in in a group in Acts 13. Go with me to Acts 13. Are you guys okay? Acts 13, 9 through 12. Saul, known as Paul, he's talking in a group of people, and he wants to get this this man saved. He wants this, 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 I guess he would be like a mayor. He would be like somebody special in, in the, you know, in in the Senate, in the world. And he's trying to speak the gospel to him. And it says this. It says, Saul, known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit. So because he had the Holy Spirit, there was a man that was a Hebrew. And he was, his name is called Bar-Jesus. When you read this story, Bar-Jesus means of Jesus. But did you know that just because it says of Jesus and he was Hebrew does not mean that this man was of Jesus. Jesus was a common name. And he was not of Jesus. He was actually used of the enemy to bring chaos and confusion in the middle of Paul teaching. Okay? And so we're picking this story up in the middle. And Paul says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he looked at this sorcerer in the eye. So he's calling this bar Jesus man a sorcerer. So he's being used of the enemy in the eye. And he said to them, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud and the enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, in the midst of the darkness, came over this man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and to lead him. When the governor, who, he was, who Paul was trying to witness to, saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. God had the final say in that. But it was because of the Holy Spirit that Paul was able to recognize what was happening and stop it from continuing. And when we operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, we will have the boldness and the power to bind what is evil and happening in our lives. We will also have the power of the Holy Spirit to be bold and confront things that are hard to confront. You say, but I don't like confrontation. You might not like it, but the Holy Spirit may need you to stop it. And you do not have to do that in your own power. You can do that with the power of God operating through you. There was a time when it was Saints Conference a few years back, and we were in rehearsal. It was probably 1130 at night. I'm walking out by myself, digging through my purse, trying to find my keys. As I walk out the back doors, there was no one with me, and there was a man. He came out from behind the pole. He was literally not even dressed except for barely hanging, sagging pants, no clothes. He was completely either intoxicated but out of his mind. And he tried to attack me. He tried to push me up against the door. I'm, uh, the door locked behind me. It's me and him in my car. And I just thought to myself, what is my move? And I panicked in a way because I didn't know, is he going to rape me? Is this going to go further than it should? I had flashbacks of my old life. And I heard the Spirit of God go, don't go there. I literally heard him go, don't go there. And he said, take authority. I heard God say, take authority. And I looked at him, and all of a sudden, when I looked at him, he was not the person I first saw, where I was afraid. And I just stood up. You know, they say to do this to bears, you know, like, look bigger than you are and scream and yell. That's what I did. And I was like, hey! (laughs) I was loud. I could be loud. I said, in the name of Jesus, this is what you're going to do. You're going to leave me alone. You're going to turn around. You're going to walk back through that basin and walk off this campus and never come back. Do you understand me? And he stops And he goes, okay. And he walks off and he goes. Why? Because he was full of demons 
and I took authority over what was about to try and put fear in me. Hold on. I have the greater one living on the inside of me. But it wasn't until I recognized, hold on, I need the power of God right now. And the Holy Spirit said, what are you doing? Why are you letting him do this to you? Right? So girls, you don't need to be afraid. You've got God living on the inside of you. And anybody who wants to do something that would harm you, you take authority over that thing. One of my girls, I don't see her in here right now. Maybe she isn't here. She was actually kidnapped. She was kidnapped from her house. And these guys were driving, joyriding with her, and they were wanting her to stop at the bank and take some money out of her, of her things. You know what she did? She started praying in tongues. She started praying in tongues, and it scared the junk out of them. They dropped her off over a musco and said, get out. Get out of the car. <laughs> That's our girls. Why? Because she knew who the Holy Spirit was. She knew, you're not going to mess with me. I'm not going to be in fear over this, but I'm going to get in faith, and I'm going to use my authority. That is the power of the Holy Spirit operating in your lives. And no longer do we have to live in this world afraid be up, busted, and disgusted. But we live in this world standing firm in who our God is, what he did at that cross, what the power of the Holy Spirit is doing in and through us, and what God needs to release on this earth, and that is in and through you that he releases it. See, Paul knew what was at stake, that he had to get them to understand what God was doing. The Holy Spirit is on your side. He is with you. He's there for you. John 16, 6 through 8 says, Instead, you grieve because of what I have told you. But in fact, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. Because he was just, let me just paint this picture real quick. He was talking to them, telling them that he has to go. And they're sad. Can you imagine? I mean, I, I just can't even imagine. I've said goodbye to a lot of people in the last few years. And it's, it sucks. Like, I literally told my mom, do I have to say any more goodbyes? I don't want to say goodbye anymore. You know, because it's just so hard. But here, they've been with him. They've been... Every day under his teaching, every day walking with Jesus. I can't even imagine how cool that was or maybe how hard that was. But here they were and he's saying, I got to go. I got to go, guys. I got to leave. And so this is what he's saying. And instead of you grieve because of what I've told you, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate, which is the Holy Spirit, won't come if I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of their sin and the God of righteousness and of the coming judgment. We are in those days. We have the Holy Spirit with us to convict us and to tell the world about his coming. Because Jesus is coming back. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit moving and operating in this. If I could leave anything with you today out of these verses, I hope that you have learned from these passages that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life and that the gospel must be preached because this is what we get to live. We get to live in the presence of God every single day. Don't take it for granted, ladies. And in order to do this, we have to live humbly with the Holy Spirit, side by side, walking along Him with him. We also must operate in the power of the Holy Spirit and trust that he is going to back us and that he's our strength and he is our guide. He's our comforter, our counselor. He's your advocate. He's your, your protector. He's your guide. You're never alone. He's your husband. He's your provider. He's all that you need. He is your everything. And when you have this understanding and when you begin to walk in these things, you have now stepped into kingdom community, kingdom ways, kingdom blessing, kingdom currency. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And when I came to you, brothers and sisters, proclaiming to you the testimony of God concerning salvation through Christ, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, not lofty words or eloquence of philosophy as a Greek order might do. For I made the decision to know nothing that is to forgo the philosophy, 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 thank you, blah, blah, blah. See, obviously I'm not that person. And the theological discussion regarding the in inconsequential things and the opinions well among you except Jesus I love this part except for Jesus and him crucified isn't that good just all day I want you to remember Jesus and he was crucified Jesus and he was crucified 
and he left me the Holy Spirit. Isn't that so good? So good. I came to you meaning of his redemption, the substitutionary death and his resurrection. I came to you in a state of weakness and fear and trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in the persuasive words of wisdom, using clever rhetoric, but they were delivered in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit operating through me and in his power, stirring the minds of the listeners, persuading them so that their faith would not rest on the wisdom and the rhetoric of man. Be careful who you're listening to, but on the power of God. If you can't find it, ladies, in here, you don't do it. Just look for it in the word. Let the word back everything you do. If you got something from God, let's just thank him. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Today I want to talk to a few of you. If you are in this room and you're going, gosh, I want that relationship with the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit active in my life. I need a relationship with Jesus Christ then today I want to give you this opportunity to come to God. You can't just think your way into heaven. You can't maybe your way into heaven just by coming to church and reading your Bible or even praying does not get you into heaven. But having a personal relationship with Jesus gets you into heaven. Jesus loves you so much that he came and he died on that cross like we talked about. He came to wash away your sins. He came to cleanse you. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness and all sin. And without it, you cannot come to the throne room of God. You cannot be saved. But because of it, you now have an open door. And all you have to do is say, yes, I want Jesus to be my personal Lord and Savior. And I believe that he is Lord and Lord and God of all. I believe that Jesus is the one true God. And you declare and you stand in faith and you say, I'm, I'm see him as God, I'm going to serve him as God, and I'm giving him my life. All of my hot mess, I'm going to bring it to the throne room, and I'm going to give it to him, and I'm going to accept him as my Lord and Savior. Today, I want to give you that opportunity. You say, but I think I need to get like myself cleaned up before I go to this incredible God. No, he came for the sinner. He came for the lost. He came for the broken. Today, you bring what it is that you have in all your brokenness to the throne room and God will meet you there and he will cleanse you, he will wash you and he will redeem you. Today is your day. If you've been overwhelmed by the things of this world and you say, I don't want that anymore, I wanna deny the world and I wanna run after God, I need Jesus in my life. Today's your day, I wanna give you that opportunity. If you've been running from God instead of to God, maybe at one time you served God. You were, you were on fire for the Lord, and you really loved the Lord with everything in you. And you walked away, and you backslid, and there's more of the world in you than there is God. That's called being lukewarm. Jesus talks about that in Revelation, and he says that if you're lukewarm, that you are either hot or you're cold. But if you are lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Why? Because Jesus says, make a decision for me. Yes or no, hot or cold. But this little wishy-washy is not good enough. I need you to say yes to me and serve me with all your heart and all your life. Give it to me. I gave everything for you on the cross. Jesus gave his life. He took himself out of deity and he stripped himself into flesh so that you and I could have a savior that would put himself on a cross so that his blood would wash away our sins. There's so much power there. Who else gave their life for you? No one. I can tell you that right now. But Jesus, he loves you so much. Your sin is not too big for him. There's nothing too big for him. He says, just come. Just make me the Lord and Savior of your life. So today, that's how I'm going to do. I'm going to go one, two, three, and I'm going to bang my hand on the pulpit like that. When I do that, I want you to raise your hand. Say, do I get saved by raising my hand? No. This isn't an abracadabra thing. This isn't a raise your hand and go through the format. But this is just you saying, I want God. This is your moment to declare, yes, I need Jesus. Because if you won't stand for him in this little room, where people are loving you and praying for you, when you walk outside those doors and all hell comes to hit you, you're going to not be able to stand then. But in this room where you're safe, where women love you, where they're praying for you right now, because we've all been there. We were all rank sinners, especially Pastor Jess. And yet God found me, rescued me, restored me. And what he did for me, he will do for you because he is not a respecter of persons, but he absolutely is in love with you. So today, get ready. If you want to know Jesus, make him the personal Lord and Savior of your life.
you've been running from God instead of to God, I want to give you this opportunity to get right with God, to run after him with everything, to give him everything. What do you have to lose? How is it working for you now? Just give God everything and you watch him do something supernatural in your life. Watch the Holy Spirit move and walk with you every day. So get ready on the count of three. One, two, three. Raise your hands if you want to get right with God. Just raise them up. Raise them up. I don't want to miss anybody's hand. We in a believers meeting today. Okay, we are. Very good. But girls, you need to start inviting people to AM. I know a lot of people work. So, but get who you can hear, okay? Because they need to hear the word of God. But I also wanted to do this. We talked about the Holy Spirit a lot today. And there's another part of what the Holy Spirit does for us. And it's that due to my power that when he comes and he fills us and he gives us the gift of speaking in tongues. And the power of the Holy Spirit comes and we get to pray and intercede on 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 the behalf of many. It's so beautiful. When I don't know what to pray, I just start praying in tongues and it edifies my spirit, man. It strengthens me to do what I could not do right before I was going into prayer. And when I speak in tongues, I'm praying those things that are supernatural over things that I don't know how to pray for. And so God intercedes on in and with us and through us through speaking of tongues. It may sound weird. It may sound like, oh, that's kind of that weird woo-woo. No, it's not weird or woo-woo because if the Spirit of God is doing it and speaking through us, you should want what he has because it's a free gift for everyone. And so today I want to offer that to you, that when you get filled with the Spirit, supernatural things start happening. You start seeing with new eyes. You start reading your Bible and you're like, ooh, I understand that in a deeper way. Or you have a conversation with somebody and you just know you have, you just have, um, you just know what God wants to say and you just have insight and you have revelation because the Spirit of God is working and that extra power is working in and through you. And I want to give you that opportunity today. So do any of you today want to be prayed over to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with speaking of other tongues? I want to just see, okay, yes, I see your hand. Anybody else? Anyone else? Pastor Sue, right here, this lady in the purple. Pastor Sue's going to pray with you, and she will just take you and will pray with you. And um, and then you can come right back to your table, okay? And she will help you. Anybody else want to go? Pastor, why don't I have you stand up right now and have you go maybe into the junior high room? And um, if you guys do want that, you can go and just follow Pastor Sue, and then she'll let you right back in to be with your tables today. I want to just give you that opportunity. We This church, man, we are.